The history of math is our intellectual foundation to understanding science. Science, beautiful, awesome, wonderful science. It's the creative foundation to our ineffable future. Hi, I'm Gabrielle Burchak, and this is my podcast, Math, Science, History. Being a resident of Los Angeles, I often find myself stuck in traffic. And believe it or not, I really do love traffic. As a bookaholic, it gives me the chance to listen to my books on Audible. Did you know that when you sign up at Audible, you get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial? You can sign up at www.audibletrial.com slash math science history and choose from over 180,000 titles for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. So many wonderful books to explore the wonders of math, science, and history. If you are listening to this podcast on March 23rd, join me in celebrating the birthday of one of the most brilliant female mathematicians to ever walk on this planet, Emmy Nurter. Her name looks like it should be pronounced Nother, N-O-E-T-H-E-R, but it's actually pronounced Nurter. She was born Amelie Emmy Nurter in 1882 to Ida Kaufman and mathematician Max Nurter in Erlingen, Germany. She had three other siblings who were all younger. This included Alfred, Fritz, and Gustav. She grew up around the turn of the century, and her country was on the verge of World War I. And so, growing up during this time, especially in Germany, was very challenging. Nurter is the acclaimed mathematician of a theorem called... Nurture's theorem. I'm not sure really which is more astounding, her theorem or the life that she lived in order to achieve the successes that she did. Technically, Nurture's theorem isn't really a theorem or a theory. It's more of a mathematical proof that is used in physics to develop theories. Nurture's theorem, in short, states that there are conservation laws of nature that correlate with symmetry laws in nature. In other words, in physics, there are laws of conservation that say that in an isolated physical system, the property measurements of that system do not change as the system evolves over time. That's conservation. Conservation remains constant, so it's conserved over time. It doesn't change. However, you only obtain that conservation if the system has symmetries. If the system does not have symmetries, then conservation laws do not apply. In other words, as long as the system has symmetries, you get conservation. So let's say you take a coin and you push it across the cement. The coin is going to slide along until it stops because the cement has friction. In this case, the momentum of the coin is not conserved. It loses momentum. So according to Nurture's theorem, the coin does not have translational symmetry. Here's another good example. Okay, the moon rotating around the earth. As it rotates around the earth, it has angular momentum, and that momentum stays the same no matter what its position is around the earth. In that instance, the angular momentum is conserved. As a result, the moon has rotational symmetry. If there's symmetry, there's conservation. If there's conservation, there's symmetry. That's Nurture's theorem in a nutshell. Emmy Nurture came up with a mathematical way to show the correlation between symmetry and conservation. It was brilliant. For visuals, I'm going to post a couple of videos on my website at mathsciencehistory.com that will help to further explain the brilliance behind Emmy Nurture's theorem. Nurture was a brilliant woman. Unfortunately, she endured obstacles to obtain the success that she did. She received an outstanding education that included piano lessons and extensive studies in French and English. By the time she was done with high school, she passed the examinations of the state of Bavaria for teachers, where women who graduated would go on to teach at girls' schools. However, she didn't want to be a language teacher. She wanted to study mathematics like her father did. However, this was a time in Germany when women were not allowed to go to college. Well, okay, they were allowed to go, but they were only allowed to 
audit the classes and not be students. So again, this was 1900 in Germany. So when she graduated high school, she left Erlingen to go to Göttingen in order to audit winter classes taught by mathematicians such as Otto Blumenthal, David Hilbert, Hermann Minkowski, and Felix Klein. However, after one semester, Erlingen opened up their universities to women. As a result, she moved back to Erlingen and enrolled in the mathematics program. She was the only woman enrolled among 46 male colleagues. She attended her father's lectures as well as lectures by Paul Gordon. And in 1907, she received her PhD in mathematics, graduating summa cum laude. For eight years, she lived at home while she worked at the Mathematical Institute, substituting for her father. You see, her father had been handicapped since the age of 14 when he came down with a case of polio. His health at times made his work difficult. This allowed his daughter to substitute for him for his classes. In 1909, she joined the German Mathematical Association and gave her first public talk. In 1915, two professors, David Hilbert and Felix Klein, invited her to work at Göttingen University. However, she was not allowed to lecture because the philologists and historians did not want female professors. So, for four years at Göttingen University, from 1915 to 1919, David Hilbert let Nerder lecture under his name. Finally, by 1919, women were legally allowed to teach and Nerder was granted an appointment to teach. However, she still received no salary. And so the math department at Göttingen University changed her title to associate professor with tenure. This allowed her to be paid through her supplemental lectures in algebra. She stayed at Göttingen University for 18 years, yet she was never offered a chair in the mathematics department because she was a woman. In 1921, she published one of her most important papers titled Theory of Ideals in Rings. It became the foundation of general commutative ring theory. And I'm actually a big fan of it. <laughs> and I did an Instagram post on ring theory that I'll post on my website as well. Just look for me with all the curly hair. Okay, back to Nerder. Her work was extraordinary. For almost 30 years, she contributed a wealth of knowledge to the development of mathematics and physics. Her work has been broken down into epochs of contribution. Her first was primarily algebraic invariance. The second epoch of her career contributed to ring theory, and the third epoch contributed to non-commutative algebra, linear transformations, and the study of commutative number fields. In other words, her contributions to physics and math were most outstanding. In 1928, she was invited to address the International Mathematical Congress at Bologna. In 1932, she turned 50 years old, and finally, accolades came her way. She was awarded the Alfred Ackerman Tubner Memorial Prize for the Advancement of the Mathematical Sciences, and she was invited to give a plenary lecture at the International Mathematical Congress in Zurich. She was the only woman invited to give this lecture. However, things changed in 1933 when the Nazi regime took over. She was dismissed from Göttingen University. It wasn't just because she was a woman. It was also because she was Jewish. She was a member of the Social Democratic Party in Germany, and she was a pacifist. Her colleagues and peers throughout Germany made many attempts to reverse this decision. However, they were unsuccessful. Relentless in her pursuits to teach math, she continued to teach out of her home. Ultimately, though, like her contemporary Albert Einstein, she left Germany for the United States. In August of 1933, she took the position of guest professorship at Bryn Mawr College. In 1934, she began to give weekly lectures at the Institute for the Advanced Study in Princeton. However, she didn't like it there. She is actually quoted as saying that it is a men's university where nothing female is admitted. Nerder taught for two years. Then, in 1935, doctors found a tumor in her pelvis. During surgery to remove the tumor, doctors found a cyst the size of a cantaloupe and two smaller tumors in her uterus. They removed the cyst and the additional tumors, and the surgery was successful. However, her recovery was not. Four days after her surgery, Emmy Nerder passed away from complications due to a possible infection. Shortly after her passing, a memorial service was held at the house of the college president. There, many great physicists spoke about her and her brilliance. 
Among them were Herman Weil, Richard Brower, John Wheeler, and Olga Towski, Todd. Around the world, tributes were written about her from Albert Einstein, Pavel Alexandrov, and many others. In her lifetime, among her colleagues, she was horribly missed and deeply treasured. She was cremated and her ashes were buried under the walkway that surrounds the cloisters of the M. Carey Thomas Library at Bryn Mawr. Nerder faced many setbacks in her effort to pursue her true love, mathematics, primarily because she was a woman. She was a pacifist, she was Jewish, and she lived in a country that, at that time, was struggling under the oppression of an ugly, heartless regime. Nevertheless, she committed her life to mathematics and changed the landscape of algebra and physics. Some say that her contributions to math and physics rescued Albert Einstein's work on relativity. Einstein even referred to her as a significant, creative, mathematical genius. Her tremendous mark on mathematics and physics wasn't just mathematical. It was gender-specific. She was one woman who overcame so much gender bias and in the process inspired so many women to pursue mathematics, physics, and science. Her story even inspires me. Her endeavors weren't easy. Even more so, her mathematics weren't either. But she kept applying herself, looking for relationships and functions and operations, opening up doors to new forms of algebra, applying mathematical concepts in number theories that created conceptual relationships in physics. And she did this all while overcoming gender bias and running from a vile anti-Semitic regime. The pathway at Bryn Mawr serves as a perfect metaphorical reminder. No doubt, she overcame difficult obstacles and in the process, Emmy Nerder forged a far-reaching path for women in mathematics. As women in science, we often think about our hurdles and we often feel like we are alone. But Emmy Nerder's life serves as a perfect reminder for us women in STEM that our hurdles will always be there. And what really matters is that we refuse to let our circumstances dictate the outcome of our lives, that we refuse to be distracted from our cerebral ideas, and that we refuse to let our circumstances pull us away from our scientific ideals that allow us to contribute to science. I'm Gabrielle Burchak. This podcast has been brought to you by Caffeine. Delicious, wonderful, nectar of the gods caffeine. Coffee, tea, coffee candy, you name it. I love it. Thank you for listening to Math Science History. If you like what you are listening to, please remember to subscribe and leave a review. I would really appreciate that. If you are interested in reading more about the history of math and science, please come visit me at mathsciencehistory.com. And while you are there, if you like what you're listening to, please feel free to click on that coffee button and buy me a cup of coffee. Until next week, carpe diem!